students cannot pass the ACCA Strategic Business Reporting or the SBL exam if they simply dump irrelevant IFRS knowledge. Because nowadays, the examining team of the SBR will heavily focus on the questions that asking students of how to define the transaction. So in other words, what sort of IFRS should be used in recognizing the transaction, for example, uh, the initial recognition of the transaction, whether or not that should be qualifying as the intangible asset per the IAS number 38, or the financial asset per the IFRS number 9. This example is completely different from what you have already studied in the financial reporting exam. So because this exam would be standing from the strategic point of view of how we define the transaction and how it would affect the financial statement. Now in this section, I'm going to be taking you through to three particular examples linking with different standards. Firstly, the IFRS number 9 financial instrument. Now, according to the IFRS number 9, what do I mean by financial instrument? It's just to be a contract. A contract giving rise that to one party, it can receive financial assets, so for example, in the form of cash. At the same time, to another party, it will create a financial liability, which means it has an obligation to pay cash. Alternatively, an equity instrument to another party, so which means another party would pay dividend to you if you buy my share. So which means the other party will issue shares. And this means that increasing the share capital and the other party would receive dividend from you. Okay, now that's the first standard. The second standard, I-516, leases. The definition for that is that, what do I mean by lease? Is that instead of buying the asset, I'm going to be leasing the asset. So to define a lease, we will need to have a right to control the identified asset, which means specifically written in the terms and conditions within a contract. We'll see a particular example how to define that later on. The final standard is all about the group defining control. In order that I'm the parent and I control the subsidiary, in order to have that control power, you need to have a power instrument, which means more than 50% of voting shares, usually it's the ordinary shares of another entity. I can use my power instrument to direct its relevant activities related to the strategic part, and from which I can obtain variable returns, not restricted only to dividend, but also if I were to set up a business enjoying the tax benefit from that, because it was a loss-making entity, so I can also demonstrate that I've got the ability to have variable returns. But how the SBR examining team will be examining these topics. Now let's see that. First example. Let's see the case on my right hand side. Let's say the company spent a hundred million dollars purchasing the right to sell the ticket for a football club and was responsible for selling the ticket. Okay, so which means I spend the money out and I buy the right that I can sell the ticket on your behalf. Okay, so you're the football club, I'm having the right so I can step into your company and to sell the tickets to generate into future uh, ticket revenue. So if that's the case then, the right, that, the, the monies that I've spent in purchasing that right, that right were not an example of financial asset, which means a coin's IFRS number nine financial instrument? But the answer is certainly no, because according to the IFRS number nine, as we can see there, if we have a contract right 
to receive cash, which means to receive financial assets, that serves him to be a financial asset there. However, in this case, we have got the right to sell ticket. Although we can generate into ticket revenue, however, we only got the right to sell a ticket rather than, in the second example, I spent a hundred million dollars purchasing the right to obtain 25% of the, of the revenue from the ticket sales generated by the football club. So which means if you have sold a hundred dollars of the revenue, I can share 25% of that because I've got the right to receive cash. So if that's the case then, the second case, yes, it would be a financial asset. And therefore, I would like to define the first case as the intangible asset per the IAS number 38. Uh, the reason is the rights to sell ticket, yes, will be identifiable, which means we sign a contract already. And it's non-monetary. So this means that it's not the right to receive cash directly, but to sell the ticket on behalf of you, okay? It's non-monetary. Monetary, which means we can get cash automatically or directly uh, from the right. Of course, without physical substance, so in other words, it's not a PPD, property plant equipment. So I rather recognize it as the intangible asset. So in the actual exam, if you're seeing the case like this, there's no point in dumping knowledge, for example, okay, I've spot, like, what do I mean by right? Okay, I would dump the knowledge regarding the initial measurement of the financial instrument. So for example, fair value through PNL, OCI, advertised cost, that kind of stuff. Uh, there's no point doing that because the examining team in this question, okay, asking you of how to define the transaction from the strategic point of view. So make sure that you now understand the exam style. Another example I can provide to you is related to leases. Now, uh, let's see the, uh, how to define lease transaction. Is that this is a contract, okay? If we've got the right to control the asset, which is identified, okay? Now, Let's see an example for this. Instead of buying the asset, I'm leasing it, which means the lessor leases the asset to the lessee, right? Now, if the lessor has the right to substitute that car, okay, this is a car, during the lease period. So if that's the case then, if lessor wants to use this car today, Although the, the car has been leased to the lessee, the lessor can substitute that car with another car. So if that's the case, then it will interrupt the use of the car by the lessee. And if that's the case, then we can see that the asset is not identified. Okay, so make sure that you're ready for that. Because what do I mean by identify is that, okay, I'm leasing that car. I can decide when to use it and how to use it. So if in any circumstances that you can substitute my car, so if that's the case then that would, would be an example that the asset is not identified. So this means that the contract does not contain a lease and subsequently of course from a lessee's point of view there's no point in recognising the right of use asset as well as the lease liability. However, another example here is that if in a lease term, the lessor restricts the customer's use of the car to specific locations. So which means when we sign the lease contract, according to the terms and conditions within there, the lessor says, you can't drive this car on this road, you can't drive this car, for example, uh, from 7 a.m. to 8 a.m. So if that's the case then, where not the asset is still identified? Well, this is a coin that IFR 16 leases. This would be a special example of protective right. 
is to protect the lessor, okay, so the car cannot be used in certain areas. So it has been agreed in the contract in the first place. So if that's the case then, I would say that still this is a lease. Still the asset is identified. However, the protective right is not the same as the substitute right. If we got the substitute right, this is not a lease, but if we got a protective right, this still a lease contract. So make sure that we're ready for that. There's no point, again, in the exam question that you ask about this, but you're dumping knowledge regarding, okay, now, uh, I'm focused heavily on the initial and subsequent measurements of the right of use, asset and lease liability, and what lease term, and the discount rate I'm going to be using, the disclosure requirement, presentation requirement, and so on. There's no point dumping the knowledge like that, so make sure that you're ready for that. Strategic part in this paper, very important key. The final example, always examined in the question one, nowadays is talking about the group standard. So for example, in order to qualify so we've got a parent and subsidiary, we need to demonstrate that we've got the control power. In order to have that control power, you need three things. Power instrument, which means more than 50% of the voting shares, or you can dominate the board for more than 50% of the board members, or you can uh, set the remuneration for more than 50% of the management team members. You can direct relevant activities related to, for example, the R&D and strategic part, and you're able to obtain variable returns in the form of dividend or perhaps that once the entity is going to go bankrupt that you can share all the remaining equity from that entity. You've got variable returns from that. Okay. Now, three criteria are met. Yes, you can demonstrate that you've got control. However, let's see a case. Company A has got 48% voting shares in Company B, which is less than 50. Analysis shows that all shareholders have voted independently in the past. Okay, now, uh, we're not, from Company A's point of view, we've got control over the Company B. But the answer is we're not particularly sure. We need to discuss about that. What do you mean by more than 50%? More than 50% was surely based on the previous voting cast. So, for example, let's say that in the past, only 70% shareholders voted. So, if that's the case, then 70% times by 50%, that would be 35. If we got 48%, that's more than 35% there, and we can confirm that we've got power instruments to control your entity. So make sure that you know why the examiner is structuring this question and testing you what part of the standard. The examiner is not testing you about variable returns, how to define them. It's not testing you about the relevant activities. There's no point in dumping the knowledge regarding the relevant activities or variable returns in the actual exam. But your main focus would be on the power instrument. How to define that 50% is according to the past voting cast from the previous annual general meetings from the shareholders. Very important issue there. So make sure that you're ready to tackle the ACCA SBI exam. Just a short introduction of myself. My name is Steve Chen, the fellow member of ACCA the technical writer for the ACCA AB magazine. I've been teaching the IFAS related papers, including the SBR for many years. I've published four accounting books related to the IFAS, helping many students to ace their IFAS studies. I look forward to seeing you in the next section. Bye for now, best of luck regarding your SBR study.
A P C accounting for your future.